It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Dr. Peter Hurst, Associate Dean, MIT Sloan Executive Education. Dr. Hurst, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Janine. Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to the latest in the Innovation at Work webinar series from the MIT Sloan School of Management's Office of Executive Education. Uh, the Innovation at Work webinar series, we bring uh, to you uh, speakers who teach in our executive education programs and invite them to uh, take a deep dive into uh, some of their latest research. Uh, we have uh, nearly 1,500 people who have registered for this webinar today all over the world, uh, which is absolutely a fantastic number, and we're very excited uh, to have with us here today Professor John Sturman, uh, who is going to talk with us about the dynamics of climate change from the political to the personal. Uh, we'll invite John to speak for uh, about 45 minutes, so we intend to have some questions and answers towards the end. Please feel free to ask questions using the platform uh, as we go through, and I will uh, put some of those questions to John a little bit to time. At the end of that, we'll have a Facebook chat as well. Uh, we invite you to stick around and, uh, and continue the discussion with us on Facebook. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, hand over to uh, Professor John Sturman. You're seeing his uh, short bio now. Uh, he's a very uh, renowned expert in this field, uh, and uh, John, uh, over to you. Um, please take it away. Great. Thank you, Peter, and welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to be here with you all. So the question that I receive most often since I returned from the Paris Climate Summit last December is whether it is the solution to the climate crisis or yet another diplomatic disappointment. I'm going to address that question with you today. And we're going to do it interactively using a computer simulation model that we've developed in partnership with our group here at MIT and Climate Interactive. And you all can go to climateinteractive.org later and get all the models and try everything out for yourself. So I will get to the question of what the impact of Paris could be. But before we do, let's step back and talk about what the real climate challenge is. It is no longer a question of the science. The science is sufficiently settled that we know that climate change is real. It is happening now. It is largely caused by human activity. It is a serious threat to human welfare. And there is still opportunity to make a difference on the issue. The problem is that it's such a difficult issue on so many dimensions that most people don't have the information, and they don't have the systems thinking tools to help them understand that information. So why is that? Well, I, I actually think climate change presents us with a perfect storm of public confusion that leads to delay in our action. First of all, on the science side, the climate is a complex, noisy, dynamical system. It's impossible to run experiments. There's incredibly difficult issues here to understand how the carbon cycle works, how that drives the climate. You see some of the data plotted here. I don't spend, I don't, won't spend any time on this. What we know is that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases have been growing dramatically, that that's the result of human activity, and that as a result, the average temperature of our planet has been rising. And in fact, we've already warmed the planet at least one degree C above pre-industrial levels. That's unprecedented in such a short amount of time and clearly due to our emissions of greenhouse gases. But it's worse than that because this is a political and equity issue around the globe. Climate change involves long time delays. It's a global problem. Everybody's emissions matter. There's enormous inequity. So the map up in the upper right here scales the size of each nation of the world to their greenhouse gas emissions. You can see China is the world's largest emitter today, followed by the United States, and then India is the third largest individual country. The European Union as a block is somewhat larger than that. But look at Africa. It's tiny. Look at South America. It's tiny. South Asia. There are many, many countries in the world where billions of people live, most of whom are far less well off economically than those of us in the affluent nations, or even in China. And they are currently not emitting much in the way of greenhouse gases, but they will suffer the most 
from the consequences of climate change. And it's a problem subject to the tragedy of the commons. So it's global emissions that count, and that means that everybody wants somebody else to cut their emissions. And if everybody behaves that way, the result is emissions don't fall. If emissions continue to grow, as you can see in the bottom left of the panel, the consequences are essentially irreversible on any human time scale. So that's a simulation from one of my colleagues, Susan Solomon, and her colleagues here at MIT, showing that if global emissions fell to zero by the year 2100, the global temperature would not fall over at least the next thousand years. This makes for a very difficult issue that people don't want to deal with. And on top of that, to understand this issue, you have to familiarize yourself with scientific concepts, unfamiliar terminology, strange units of measure that people don't know. Units of measure like parts per million and parts per billion of greenhouse gases, gigatons of CO2 equivalent emissions per year, watts per meter squared of radiative forcing, and for those of us in the United States, degrees Celsius, which we don't understand. So this is an extremely tough problem, and it's made worse by the political dynamics. This is an issue where there are powerful vested interests that are aggressively working to discredit the science, confuse the public, and delay action. And opinion polls show that the way people think about the climate problem is strongly conditioned not by science, but by their political ideology. And you can see a few examples here of climate denier actions trying to persuade the public that the science is uncertain and we shouldn't do anything. It's absolutely clear that this is a coordinated campaign by the vested interests seeking to protect their revenue at the expense of the welfare of all of humanity. So, small wonder with all these problems that most people, when presented with a presentation on climate change, such as the one you're participating in today, run screaming from the room, not another lecture on climate change. So the, the problem that we face is not just one of presenting the best scientific information to the public. The problem is one of engaging the public in active learning on a topic that is so big, so complex, seems to make it so difficult for anyone to make a difference, and is fraught with political issues such that minds are often not open and people are often not even willing to engage on the issue. So what is our approach here? Well, being MIT, of course, our approach is to be absolutely rigorously grounded in the best available climate science. And as a scientist, I'm not willing to step one nanometer over the line. But just telling people what the science says won't work. In fact, the social science research on this is very clear. The research shows that showing people research doesn't work. So what we have done in our project with Climate Interactive is to develop a suite of interactive simulation models. One is called C-ROADS, the Climate Rapid Overview and Decision Support System. And what this model does is replicate with high fidelity the behavior of the large supercomputer-based integrated climate models that are used around the world by, for example, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But we've designed the model so that it runs interactively in about one second on an ordinary laptop. And it's open source. You can get the model. You can try it out for yourself. And as you'll see, you can use it with your community, your peers, and your colleagues to begin to explore and learn for yourselves how the climate works and what might be done to reduce the threat from climate change. So how is our model being used? Well, uh, it's being used by a variety of policymakers around the world, and including the United States climate negotiating team out of the State Department. It's used in China, in Brazil, in other countries. The United Nations Secretary General's Office has used it. It's used by UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program, in their emissions gap studies, uh, along with other models, and other 
policymaker groups have used it as well. And you see here a few of the folks who have personally used the model. On the upper right, Christiana Figueres, who has just stepped down as the head of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. She has personally used the model. Secretary of Energy Ernie Moniz has personally used the model. Todd Stern on the uh, middle right is the outgoing Special Envoy for Climate Change for the United States, our top climate negotiator. Uh, he's been replaced by Jonathan Pershing. All these people have personally used the model. My colleague Drew Jones. Uh, in the bottom right is a member of the Climate Interactive team and an MIT alum who is with Professor Hu Jin-kun from China, who's one of the advisors to the Chinese government on climate. And John Kerry, as Secretary of State, has personally used the model. His comment uh, you can see here, I have to tell you Sea roads works, it's important, and it's already getting broad dissemination. I used it, and he really did. So it's being used by senior policymakers and negotiators around the world, and that's terribly important but it's also nowhere near sufficient. I began by asking whether Paris was a success or yet another diplomatic disappointment. And uh, to preview the conclusion, it is the best agreement we've ever had. And recognizing that politics is the art of the possible, I believe we achieved in Paris, the negotiators achieved in Paris, just about everything that was possible and maybe even a little bit more. And at the very same time, it's still utterly inadequate. But suppose that in Paris a perfect agreement had been reached, an agreement sufficient to reduce the threat by lowering global greenhouse emissions and keeping the global average temperature no higher than 2 degrees C or 3.6 Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels. That's the official target. Suppose that had been accomplished. What would happen? What would happen when that agreement reached in Paris came back to all the key capitals around the world, to New Delhi, to Jakarta, to Mexico City, Brasilia, the, to Washington? Uh, the answer is it would be dead on arrival. There's nowhere near enough political support to pass the enabling legislation and enact the policies that would be needed to achieve the emissions cuts that are required to limit warming to no more than 2 degrees C, 3.6 Fahrenheit. So the challenge is no longer the science. The challenge is how to create a broad base of public support for the actions that are needed in order to reduce the risks of catastrophic climate change. And that's where simulations like sea roads come in. So what I'd like to do now is shift over from the slides to sea roads itself, and we'll see if we can do a little interactive simulation. So what you should be seeing now is the sea roads model running live, and this is the business as usual scenario. Under business as usual, global total carbon dioxide emissions on the left-hand graph are projected to rise. We have historical data up through today, and then business as usual projection showing an increase in global carbon dioxide emissions up to somewhat over 100 billion tons of CO2 emitted into the atmosphere every year by the year 2100. And all nations around the world are contributing to that. At the bottom, we see the emissions from the United States in red. Then we see the emissions from the European Union in green. On top of that, from the other developed nations, Canada, Australia, Russia, and the former Soviet republics, Japan, South Korea, etc. On top of that, we see in blue China's emissions, the largest emitter in the world today, then India, and then the gray band is all the other developing nations of the world. So all of Africa, South America, the Middle East, South Asia, other than India, small island states of the Pacific and so forth. The consequence of that growth under business as usual is the steady rise in global average surface temperatures, which you can see on the right-hand side. And we blast through the two-degree limit that was agreed in Paris uh, well before the halfway mark of this century, just after 2040, and we get up to four and a half degrees C, or 8.3 Fahrenheit by 2100. 
this is potentially catastrophic. So just to show a few of the potential impacts, as there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, which you can see in this graph, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere steadily rising from the 400 parts per million it is today to over 900 parts per million by 2100. That leads to a steady acidification of the ocean, which threatens the base of the global food web upon which all life, including ours, depends. In addition, sea level rise is continuing. It's already rising today and it's projected to accelerate. We stick to the accepted IPCC estimate, which gives an estimated sea level of around 1.2 meters by 2100, with many meters more after that. But the science has moved on and one of the features of our model is we don't ask you to accept our assumptions. We think we have the best available assumptions based on the peer-reviewed science, but we don't ask you to accept those. You're free to try other assumptions. So for example, the current science suggests sea level rise is proceeding faster than the IPCC expected. So I'll just add a little more sea level rise here to the model from accelerated melting of the global ice sheets. And the result is that sea level could be up to two meters by the year 2100 and perhaps even a little higher. So you, as a user of this model, are free to try whatever assumptions you like. I'll reset this back to our base case. And now let's take a look at what the impact of Paris might be. So under the base case, we're headed for four and a half degrees C. There is some uncertainty band around that that I'm not showing you today. Uh, but under no, no circumstance, no matter how lucky we get, does business as usual give us any chance, any probability of hitting the two degree limit. So let's take a look at what Paris might do. So I'll load our simulation in which we've added up the commitments that every nation has made under the Paris Accord. We've assumed that every one of those commitments will be fully implemented but we are not crediting countries with actions they have not committed to take. Now, committing to take an action in Paris is not the same as actually reducing your emissions. They have to ratify the agreement, which is a process underway now, but most nations have not yet done so. They have to then implement and enact the enabling legislation and policies to actually begin to cut their emissions. We're assuming all of that happens 100%. And you can see the impact on the left is that global emissions begin to flatten right around now and stay pretty flat through 2030. The Paris Agreement only specifies emissions cuts. Most nations have only specified their emissions cuts out to 2030 and they are silent about what happens after that. Emissions continue to grow after 2030 because the developing countries of the world, including India, Africa, South America and so forth, that's where most of the population growth in the rest of the century will be. That's where most of the economic growth is going to be. And that's where today most of the poor folks in the world who have no steady access or any access to electricity, to mobility, to transportation, to any of the energy infrastructure that we take for granted and as they get the refrigeration and the electricity and the transportation and the travel and so forth that they legitimately deserve their emissions continue to grow after 2030. And as you can see on the right, the result is three and a half degrees C of warming even if Paris is fully implemented and we delay the time that we cross the two degree threshold by less than a decade. And sea level rise, very little impact. Ocean acidification, somewhat reduced, but still becoming more acidic. So why is this happening and what can we do about it? Well, let's, let's go back to our business as usual simulation and let's see what we might be able to do about this. So we have the ability here with a simple interface that we've designed for educational use to try different policies. So, uh, so Peter, let's do this interactively. Peter, in what year do you think the United States would have to stop the growth of its greenhouse emissions in order for it to comply with its 
commitment under the Paris Accord. I think right now. You're absolutely right. We'd have to cut our emissions, stop the growth of our emissions right now. So I'll put 2016 in and watch the red band. Now what you see is U.S. emissions in red stop growing today and remain flat through the rest of the century. And as a consequence, there's a small reduction in expected global temperatures. Now, in what year, Peter, would the United States have to begin reducing its emissions to be able to comply with its commitment under the Paris Accord? That would be right now, too. Also right now, let's just, since it's already the middle of 2016, we'll put 2017 in. And at what rate would our emissions have to fall? Absolute rate in percent per year, it's about 2% per year. So let's put 2% in there. And we also have forestry and land use impacts in the model. Uh, deforestation is not a tremendous problem in the United States, although we do have a significant wildfire problem. But let's say we can reduce our forest losses by half of the potential that scientists assess and maybe even plant some more trees maybe at 60% of the potential that scientists assess. So that's the impact of the United States complying with its Paris Agreement and then continuing to ratchet up our ambition, cutting our emissions after 2030 all the way through the end of the century, and by the end of the century, we basically have a clean, prosperous, low-carbon economy running on renewable energy. And it makes a small difference to global temperatures. So what about the European Union? So Julie, um, what would the European Union have to do? They'd have to start now. Yesterday. Right, exactly like the United States. They would have to begin their emissions cuts now to be able to comply with their Paris commitment. And in fact, that's already happening. It's already underway. And so their emissions cuts would also begin essentially now. And we'll assume at the same rate, 2% per year, and about the same level of ambition for their forests relative to their potential. And you can see that also makes a difference. So the red and the green bands, the US and the EU, their emissions are steadily falling. They have carbon-free, prosperous economies by the end of the century. And it has reduced expected global temperature rise by about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 degrees C. Now, what about all the other developed countries? Colby, what about Australia, Japan, Canada, well, um, we know Canada depends on tar sands. Australia exports a lot of coal, and Rus Russia exports coal, oil, and gas. So they don't really want to cut their emissions. Um, they really want to just keep producing. That's right. So they are willing to commit to some reductions, but there's a lot of political pressure in those countries to keep those export industries going. So in what year do you think they might actually, as a group, uh, cap the growth of their emissions? Uh, maybe 2025? 2025. So this is your simulation. So let's try 2025. Now watch the uh, brown band here. That's the other developed countries. And now you can see that uh, total emissions have fallen somewhat. Now are they willing? Do you think they might be willing to cut their emissions? Maybe. And what year do you think that might be? 2030? 2030. Great. Let's try that. And at what annual rate do you think? Two percent? Yeah, so maybe they'll match what the U.S. and the EU are willing to do, but later. And there are significant boreal forests in uh, Canada and Russia, so maybe they're willing to make the same kind of commitment on their forestry uh, as the other nations. So what you see now is the impact of all the developed nations of the world making cuts that are so somewhat consistent with their Paris commitments, and then continue after 2030 to decline until we have a nearly carbon-free economy. So now what about China, the world's largest emitter? Julie, what do, what, what do you think China's uh, commitment is? Um, well, they pledged to cut their emissions by 2030. Great. So let's just put 2030 in. They did, in fact, pledge in Paris to cap their emissions by 2030. And as the largest emitter, that makes quite a big difference. They did not, however, commit in Paris to any reduction in their emissions. Now, this still requires them to make progress because their economy is going to continue to grow, holding emissions constant. Uh, and they might be willing to make the same commitment on forestry uh, as the other nations. So that does matter. Now, what about India? What about India? Peter, what do you think India's 
going to going to commit. Well, I think this is going to be more of a challenge because India's got a commitment to lifting its population out of poverty, and that's going to require a lot of growth. Uh, so the one thing they did do is commit to uh, cut emissions intensity by a third by 2030. That's right, but what would that mean for actual emissions? Well, so then, because their economy is growing, their emissions are still going to be rising on that time horizon. That's exactly right. Cutting the emissions intensity of their economy, how much carbon per rupee of GDP, is, is certainly valuable. Uh, but because their economy is projected to grow faster than their commitment to cut intensity, their total emissions would continue to grow, and in fact, continue to grow uh, until at least 2030 at the business as usual rate. Uh, so, are, do you think they might be willing to do something after 2030? Um, maybe, but won't their emissions keep rising? Yeah, probably. So, do you want to leave it as business as usual, or do you want to actually have India cap their emissions at some point in this century? It's your simulation. You can okay. do whatever you okay. want. Okay, well, let, let's be very optimistic and assume that they will cap. Uh, it, let's it, say, but by 2060? 2060. Great. Let me put in your estimate of 2060. Now, that's the black band, and you can see now that their emissions are constant after 2060, and they might be willing to take the same actions on forestry and perhaps save the Bengal tiger from extinction. Uh, now, what about all the other developing countries of the world? What do you think is going to happen there? Julie? Um, I'd say maybe by 2075. Yeah, so this is, okay, let's try your assumption, 2075. And, and then hold their emissions constant while their economy and their population continues to grow, which means that they're still making progress on energy efficiency and renewables. Uh, and now take a look at what we've got. What we have is a situation where total global emissions now peak and remain essentially constant by the latter third of the century. So by around 2070 or so, total global emissions are constant. But projected temperatures continue to rise, and in fact, much like the simulation of the Paris Accord, we don't gain much time before we cross the two degree threshold, and we end up at about three and a half degrees Celsius of warming, which is very close to what the Paris Commitment would do. And as I've shown you, the result is Ocean acidification continues, although somewhat more slowly. Sea level rise continues at almost the same pace as before. So what we've got is a situation where, with your estimates, which are yours, but we can try whatever you like, we have made a significant dent in the problem, but it's nowhere near enough. And so the question is why? I mean, after all, global emissions have peaked. And take a look at this graph, which compares in red, the business as usual trajectory with steady growth in global emissions to the emissions that result from your suggestions in which growth is much lower and in fact emissions are flat. We've stabilized emissions in the last third of the century and yet temperature keeps rising and greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere keep rising, reaching over 700 parts per million by the end of the century. So why is it, why is it that Emissions are constant, but concentrations and temperature keep going up. What's going on here? Colby, what's going on? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, let's figure it out together. Uh, any suggestions? Um, I think we're still emitting more CO2 into the atmosphere than nature can remove. Sure. That's exactly right. So the, the green line in this graph is the emissions under the current scenario. But what we need to know is how does that compare to the rate at which carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere? So when CO2 is removed, where does it go? Well, any ideas? Maybe uh, into biomass? Yeah. So as plants grow, as biomass uh, grows, and that's both terrestrial plants, trees, crops, and phytoplankton in the ocean, that removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And uh, where else might it go? Any ideas? Well, it dissolves into the ocean. So the ocean actually takes up quite a lot of the carbon dioxide. So let's take a look at the removal flux as well as emissions. So in this graph, what you see in red is global emissions under your scenario, 
which are rising much more slowly than before and flat from about 2060 on. And then the green line is the flux, the flow of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere, taken up by biomass, dissolving in the ocean. And what you can see is that we are spewing carbon dioxide, even with this scenario, into the atmosphere about twice as fast as it's being removed. So Julie, you know, you have a bathtub in your house, right? Yes. Okay, so what happens if you fill up your tub twice as fast as the water drains out? It just keeps rising and overflows. Yeah, it's going to keep rising. Eventually it's going to overflow. If you don't stop that, you're going to overflow your tub and it's going to destroy your house. And it's exactly the same story here. What we're seeing is that the global carbon bathtub is being filled up twice as fast as it can be drained. And as a result, concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere keep growing and the temperature keeps rising and all the harmful impacts of climate change keep growing worse. So in order to stabilize concentrations, we have to bring that red line of emissions down to the green line. And of course, the green line will vary based on how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. So let's go back and see if we can be more ambitious. So let's start with the other uh, developed economies, Canada, Australia, Russia. Right now, they're lagging behind the U.S. and the EU. So, you know, Peter, in what year do you think we might, through a great deal of diplomacy and horse trading, persuade them to cap and begin to decline their emissions? Um, still not very much more optimistic. Uh, let's, say, let's say 2050? No, sooner than 2025. Oh, 2025. You've already got 2025. Okay, so, um, let's say 2015. 2012. All right, so as, as ambitious as the United States and right. the EU. And to begin a decline? Uh, we'll take another 10 years. So 2026. Yeah. Great. And at that same 2% rate. And that helps a little bit. But the real action is going to be in the developing world because that's where the largest emitters are today and where most of the growth in emissions is going to come. Now, let me say a word about equity before we do this. These are the countries that are the poorest in the world and need and legitimately deserve to bring their populations out of poverty so that they can enjoy the same uh, benefits of the global economy that, that we in the affluent nations do. And they legitimately have that aspiration. What this means is that we in the affluent countries are going to have to undertake the financing and technology transfer and other forms of assistance so that those nations can leapfrog the harmful fossil economy and go straight to a clean, renewable, low carbon economy in the same way that Africa leapfrogged landline telephony, never built that infrastructure and went straight to mobile telephony. So let's start with China. China has pledged to cap their emissions in 2030. Julie, uh, in what year might they actually begin to decline, to, to, to see a decline in their emissions? Well, I think they need to cut their emissions, not just cap them. Right. So uh, maybe 2035? 2035. Let's try that. And do you think they could match our rate of 2% per year? Um, sure. Why not? Let's try it. We can try whatever we like. Uh, so that makes a big difference. Uh, you can see now the blue band of Chinese emissions peaks and falls significantly by the end of the century. Now, what about India? Colby, what about India? Right now, we have them not undertaking any action until 2060 as their economy continues to grow. But if we had enough technology transfer and financing, mm -hmm. what do you think might be feasible? Uh, how about 2035? 2035. Let's try that. So that's the black band. And... Uh, for a decline? 2040. 2040, okay. And 2% per year? Sure. Same technology uh, improvement rate with efficiency and clean energy that we've seen as in the others. And now what about all the other developing countries? So they're not doing anything right now until 2075. Peter, what do you think we might be able to do if there was enough financial, technical, and other forms of assistance? Well, I'd say the same as India, 2035. Great, let's try that. And 2040 for a decline? Yeah, absolutely. Great. And 2%? Makes sense. All right. And uh, there's a lot of forests, a lot of tropical forests there. Let's see if we can have some deforestation and afforestation there. So now, notice what's happened. The 
global emissions have peaked now in around the year 2030 and fall significantly. In fact, they fall below where they are today by 2100. We don't have a perfectly carbon-free economy by 2100, but we're getting there. Let's take a look at our global emissions now compared to business as usual. We have a peak in global emissions by 2030 and a significant decline. And carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere on the right-hand side are now almost flat by the latter third of the century. So let's take a look at the carbon bathtub and see if that's really working. And you can see that we've almost balanced the tub. The red line of emissions is almost matched by the green line of removals. Now one thing you'll notice here is that the green line is falling. That's a process known as sink saturation. There's a limit to how much carbon biomass can take up and how much the oceans can absorb. And we're seeing that limit being reached here. So does that get us to two degrees? Well, let's find out. The answer is no, but we've significantly improved our chances. Now we're stabilizing at under two and a half. And if we had even more ambition, so perhaps China might peak earlier, 2025, and begin a decline earlier in 2030. And perhaps we can increase the rate at which emissions are reduced by another quarter of a point for everybody. Let's see what that would do. And it starts to balance the tub earlier and make quite a large difference to our outcomes. Now, none of this will happen automatically. It's going to take considerable hard work in negotiations, a lot of compromise, and a great deal of financial and technical assistance in order to achieve an outcome like this. But it is technically possible. And my main point in showing you all this is that we have an interactive tool that anyone can use for themselves to try any scenarios and any assumptions they want about how the climate works. Now, let's go back and talk about how we use the model outside of the negotiation. I mentioned before, it's used by negotiators and senior policymakers around the world. But that's not enough. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So what we have done is we have created an interactive role play experience that we call the World Climate Exercise. It's an interactive role play mock negotiation of the global climate negotiations held by the UNFCC, so similar to what happened in Paris uh, last year and what's happening in Morocco this fall. And what we do is we bring groups, and we've done this with every kind of group from senior policymakers, CEOs, and other senior business leaders, leaders in civil society, all the way down to high school and middle school students. We bring them together. We assign them in, to play the role of the negotiators for the different blocks that you've just seen, the United States, the EU, China, India, et cetera. And they uh, receive briefings, confidential briefing materials that tell them what their negotiating position is and gives them some data they can use in their negotiations with the other parties. We normally assign people to play out of their roles. So for example, here's some photos from the World Climate Session that we ran in Paris at the Climate Conference. It was an open enrollment group, so we had people of all ages and from all parts of the world. Uh, when we started out, I said, who's here from the European Union? Hands went up. I said, great, today you're China. Who's here from China? Great, today you're the United States, and so forth. So people were playing out of their normal affiliations. And, uh, and they have to negotiate face-to-face -face with the other people and come up with their commitment, their intended nationally determined commitment to reduce emissions. And then we run them through the simulation live. So what is it really like? Well, I'm going to show you a little video uh, of, uh, of what it's like to play the game. And this is work that was done by our colleague, Professor Juliet Rooney Varga, who's a member of our team. And she had the opportunity to run the World Climate Seminar at the high school here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Cambridge Ringe and Latin. 
And being a good scientist, what she did is she ran a control treatment and a, an experimental treatment. The control treatment was a standard lecture as is given all the time to students and policymakers around the world. And what you're going to see is a short video clip of how the students reacted. Can we push out clip one, please? We've introduced some pretty complex topics, and that this model is able to take into consideration a lot of these, these aspects of, that are related to climate change. So what you see here is... And it, as you can see, there's no learning going on in the presence of a standard lecture, even a good lecture. Now, what happened when the students were given the opportunity to play the roles of the negotiators and enact the diplomatic process for themselves? So let's push out clip two. Watch the students negotiate. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Stop talking to me. If it was a regular start, we would have our money. Get both of us. 13. I mean, I mean, 13. And then you've got the U.S. Army. We do not have any of these billion dollars to give to another country. We're on a nuclear campaign. If we give you that much money, half of people in our life will die. In America, will die. Will die. Will die. Will die. Will die. Where's the money coming from? We're already a bankrupt. We get it's coming from the other countries. Who makes all your crap? The other countries. If, if they die, you guys So you're going to supply us with free food and everything? No, I'm serious. Oh, yeah. Your stuff. No, when you we buy it. We buy it. From you. We don't get it for free. Wait, stop. 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 As you can see, there's a dramatic change in the energy level, and in fact, they are learning. So we've gathered data through pre-test, post-test questionnaires with a wide range of groups who have played this simulation all over the world, and the data show that people are learning more from this exercise about the science, they're learning more about the political situation, they are more willing to take action in their personal life to cut their own carbon footprint. They're more willing to talk to other people about the climate change challenge. And in every way, people are learning more, being more motivated to take action. So it really does work. So how is this used? Well, it's being used all over the world. Uh, it's freely available. And this slide is actually out of date. As of this week, there have been uh, events in 57 countries and almost 19,000 people have participated as of where we stand today in the middle of July. Uh, this is all freely available and people like yourselves can download all the information that you need, not only to use it, but to learn how to facilitate it. And I would encourage you to go to the climateinteractive.org site where you can get all the information you need all the briefing materials, the model, videos of people running it, instructors materials and so forth. Take it out to your community and help build the political support. And the key thing about this is we don't tell anybody what they should propose for emissions reductions. They choose, as you saw in the, in the demonstration earlier. So we're not pushing any particular set of policies. We're not pushing any particular allocation of emissions reductions around the world. And in fact, the discussion gets quite hot as the different groups debate who should pay, who should cut, how would this work, and how can it be done in the real world. So we're going to switch over to questions in just a minute, but uh, the question always comes up after the role play or at this point in the demonstration. Well, we could cut our emissions. It is technically possible. We have the technology today ready to go, off the shelf. Wind is getting cheaper and cheaper. Solar is getting cheaper and cheaper. It's growing very fast around the world. Uh, so we have the technology today for efficiency, for clean power that doesn't produce carbon emissions, but people don't think it's affordable. So we don't have time to go into the details here, but let me give two very fast examples of how it's affordable. This is the new Sloan School of Management building where we are right now speaking to you. This building was uh, occupied in the year 2010. It's a LEED Gold building. 
and uh, is quite a large office and classroom building. And the question is, how much more did it cost to build it so that it's sustainable and green compared to the standard code compliant building that we could have built? And we have lots of insulation in the building. We've got daylight controls, occupancy sensors to control the lighting. We've got radiant floor heating and cooling uh, in the building. We've done quite a lot to make the building efficient. And the question is, how much more did it cost? Well, take a second and just ask yourself, how much more do you think the capital costs were? Write it down. Write it down on a piece of paper. Did it cost less to make it a green building? About the same, up to 10% more, 10 to 20% 20 more, 20 to 50 or even 50% more or larger? Take a second and write down your answer. Now, let's ask what most people say. So when I survey my students and executives who come here, the answer that most of them give is around 20% more. So what's the right answer? Well, the right answer is we saved money because it uses so much less energy. We spent more on the windows, we spent more on the insulation and so forth, but we saved money on the air handling, the HVAC system, uh, the electrical infrastructure, and as a result, the building itself was only 1.6% more expensive to build. And it's actually even cheaper than that because with so much less energy use, it meant MIT didn't have to expand its chiller capacity or steam generation capacity. And that's, <coughs> excuse me, worth another $2 million. And so the net capital costs <coughs> are only a quarter of a percent more. And the net present value, <coughs> excuse me, the net present value of the building <coughs> is positive. $9.7 million. So not only is it technically possible to cut our carbon emissions dramatically, but we can actually make money in many cases by doing it. At this point, what I'd like to do is bring the formal session to a close so that we can take questions and uh, we hope that you'll submit any questions that you have for us now. Thank you. Sure, thanks very much, uh, John. This is, uh, I think, a very fascinating for everyone and quite alarming for us all as well. And we've had some questions as you were going through the simulation, pointing out that perhaps we were being quite optimistic uh, in terms of uh, the behaviors and responses. Uh, and uh, wondering about what your view of that is. You said it's technically feasible to meet uh, these kinds of goals? Yeah, absolutely. It's, there's no question that it's technically feasible today to produce the energy that we need without carbon emissions. Uh, just to give another example, my wife and I recently completed a deep energy retrofit on our house, and uh, we took it from a rather inefficient structure that was built in 1928 to a better than zero net energy home that now, after one year of occupancy data since the project was completed, we produced 54% more energy than we used through a combination of the solar panels and extensive insulation and high efficiency appliances. And it's more comfortable and we have, we're not freezing in the dark, it's actually more comfortable than it was before. So we have a negative carbon footprint for our home. This is something that's easily doable uh, in the developed countries and with sufficient technology transfer, uh, it's doable everywhere in the world. In fact, it's perhaps easier elsewhere in the world because they aren't locked in to the existing carbon infrastructure in many parts of the world to the extent that we are here. So the question is, is it politically possible? And, uh, and there, I think the answer is, yes, it is, if there's a lot of hard work and engagement by people around, around the world in every country. There are plenty of successful examples of grassroots activists who have succeeded in shutting down coal plants, in promoting green energy. This is something that can happen just as the civil rights movement, the movement to abolish slavery in the 1700s, uh, the movement to end apartheid 
uh, and others uh, were able to bring about social and political change that at the time nobody thought was possible. These things have happened and we can do them again. But it requires that everybody become active. Cutting your own carbon footprint is essential. You have to walk your talk, but it's not enough. We have to have a collective grassroots political movement in order to create the political pressure for our leaders to make the emissions cuts that we need. Is that really the nub of the problem? It seems like there are, there, there are two effects uh, that we're seeing in some of the questions that people are asking about. One is uh, for those that are uh, believing both the science and the, and, and the consequences and the human activity is a driver here, uh, that it's still hard for it to feel relevant in our daily lives and to make those kinds of changes. And that's before you even get to the segment of people who may still believe that there is no human connection here. And how, how does this kind of work uh, impact those two aspects of this? So these are, this really is the heart of the matter. You put your finger exactly on it. And, and there's a couple things that are important for people to understand. First, there's no scientific doubt about the reality of human-caused climate change. And there is an ongoing coordinated campaign by the vested interests to confuse people and undermine that science. So it is a political battle. But in addition, it's not a matter of sacrifice. In fact, as I have cut my own personal carbon footprint, I've been a bicycle commuter essentially my whole career here at MIT. We compost all our food. And as I just described, we now have a better than zero net energy home. Becoming more sustainable is not a matter of sacrifice. In fact, it's the most fun I've ever had. It's really quite exciting. And as people do more and more of this, it will spread in a viral social way. Look at the spread of the world climate role play simulation that we just discussed. 19,000 people in just the last couple of years around the world have done this in countries literally from A to Z, Argentina to Zimbabwe and everywhere in between. This is not because People are scared as much as they find that this is important, they find that it's enlightening, it's empowering, and they are willing and able to go out and tell other people and engage them in the exercise. And it's the same thing when you take action in your own, in your own community. So I'm an optimist on this. It's definitely an extraordinarily difficult issue, but I believe we can do it. We've done harder things before. We ended slavery. We brought a peaceful end to apartheid in South Africa. Nobody thought this was possible, and yet it happened. We can do it. So your, a lot of your work and your history academically is in the field of system dynamics uh, and, and promoting the concept of systems thinking, uh, both as a tool for business in our case, uh, but in other respects as well. How big is the challenge that actually uh, we're not really, as human beings, configured and we're not educated to understand the, the systemic effects of how systems work? Is, is this a, a real difficulty that we need to be addressing? So I, I think you can make an argument that people didn't evolve naturally to be systems thinkers, but I don't find that to be productive. I don't find that to be helpful. In my experience as a teacher, uh, first of all, I don't think I can teach anybody anything. You know, at best, what I can do is try to create an environment in which people can learn for themselves. And that's why we've developed the role play simulation that you've just seen, so that people can learn for themselves, try their own assumptions, try their own beliefs, see what would happen if, and do that in a group setting where they can talk through all the issues that come up. I want to step back. I want to become less of the sage on the stage and more of the guide on the side, as Alison King famously said uh, about education. So can people learn to be better systems thinkers? Uh, I think the answer is absolutely yes. And I think people want to. I, pe I think people have the capability. I think everybody can improve their abilities when they have the opportunity to learn for themselves. People want to do well. They want to understand, and they want to make a difference. So uh, returning to this, the question of what people, or what you would hope people will do, and how we respond to uh, this kind of information and, and the insights that, that we get from simulations like this, 
Uh, I heard you say earlier something about, you know, you, 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 we, we all need to walk the talk. Uh, but what's the balance? Is there a balance between the decisions we're making in our personal lives uh, and decisions that we're making in our work and business lives that, that affect uh, how our organizations uh, or how we as individuals are part of the problem or part of the solution here? You mentioned, for example, uh, the building here at the Sloan School, and that was an example of the of an organizational response. Do we have to do it you know, across the board, or should we be focusing somewhere? Well, I think we have to do it across the board, but it's the old story of think globally and act locally. So uh, we need a global understanding of what the challenge is, and tools like Sea roads and our other models and the World Climate Exercise can help people gain that global perspective and understand the political difficulties that are entailed. And then we have to act where we are, where we can make a difference personally. Uh, and, and on all fronts, cut your own personal carbon footprint, tell everybody that it was a lot of fun, because I think it will be. It certainly has been for, for us here at MIT and in my own personal life. Uh, and then get out there and, and, and uh, give other folks, create opportunities for other folks to learn some of these things for themselves. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, it, we are embedded in organizations and in an economy that, through nobody's explicit choice, is undermining the future and putting our children and grandchildren and all children at risk. And I don't know very many people who think that's okay. When I talk to people in organizations at all levels, from CEOs down to the frontline workers, they know that what they often do in their daily organizational life is undermining the future, and they don't like it. They don't want to be in that position. People really would like to align what they do in their professional life and in their career with what they most deeply care about. And there's a tremendous hunger out there to do that. What do you say to the pessimists who look at models like this and say, even though there's an optimistic scenario that you've described, that really, realistically, it's already too late, and so you know, what's the point of trying to dig to uh, bolt the door now that the horse is, uh, shut the door now the horse is bolted? So we don't want to try to predict. We want to change the future. There's an old joke that says when you're falling out of an airplane, it's better to have a parachute than an altimeter. I'm not interested in predicting what's going to happen. I'm interested in creating the future that we all want. So uh, I'm, I'm an optimist that we can do that. Great. Well, thanks very much, uh, Professor John Sturman. We're just about out of time for this uh, live component of the webinar. Uh, we're just going to show you some information about uh, the programs that uh, John Sturman teaches in here at MIT Sloan Executive Education. Uh, there's also a link to the uh, climateinteractive.org website, and these slides will be available uh, later, and some further reading that John has recommended. Uh, but now it remains for me to thank John again, once again, for uh, this live component of the webinar and to move us across to the Facebook discussion. So if uh, Janine, you'd be now kind enough to push out the Facebook link uh, to our audience, uh, we'll move over to that uh, medium. Thank you very much, John, uh, and uh, we'll see you all on Facebook, we hope. And thank you to all our participants for joining us today. In a brief moment, the link to the Facebook discussion with Professor Sturman will appear again on your screen. We hope you found this webcast informative. This concludes our program, and you may now disconnect. Everyone have a good day.